may be seated. Open in the Bible, your Bibles to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Hello. We'll be in verses 5 through 7 this morning. Continue our study in the book of 1 Timothy. We've entitled it Foundations for Faithfulness. And the message is entitled this morning, Products of Truth and Error. Should I do something different a little bit here, Ken? It's off, yeah. Just plug your ears a little bit and it'll be fine. First Timothy chapter 1, we'll, we'll, we'll hear the word of the Lord, verses 5 to 7. The aim of our charge is love that issues from pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that your word goes out clear. We thank you that uh, you've given it to us as your people, and we pray that you would uh, create in us clean hearts, soft hearts, Lord, open hearts to hear uh, from you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week, we heard Paul's opening exhortation to Timothy from verse 3, where he says to him to remain at Ephesus in order to maintain the faith against the threat of false uh, doctrine and false devotion. So Timothy, uh, a young pastor of the time, was to remain at the church where there was a a serious threat to the truth uh, in order to encourage, in order to charge and command uh, the false teachers to cut it out and to uh, build up the the faith of the saints that was delivered there. In verse 4, we saw last week, he offers a bit of a comparison to help identify truth from error based on what each one promotes, based on each what, what, what each one promotes. He says in verse 4 uh, that, that some of them are devoting themselves, or uh, some of them are promoting speculations rather than stewardship. So that's the, that's the comparison, speculations versus stewardship. Does the teaching, as they're hearing it live in Ephesus, does the teaching promote things like maybes, lots of maybes, or does it have the marks of a faithful transfer of truth? Is it a stewardship? Uh, Ken, would it be better if I switch to this? Yeah, let's do that. All right, I'll just shut this thing off. How about this? There we go. Okay. All right, so speculations versus stewardship. Uh, I want you to imagine for a minute a a small town, and in that town there is a uh, family-run widget store that's been run by the Whitakers, yes, Whitakers Widget Store, uh, for three generations, okay? This this young, uh, this small uh, business has been in the family, passed on from generation to generation, and they've been making these somewhat expensive but reliable, time-tested widgets for generations, now, the, the sales for this small business are mostly driven uh, by gifting these widgets because most of the time they never run out. So great-grandma's widget is just good enough for, for great-grandson. It, it just gets passed down from family to family, but they're so good, they're such a good product that they want to make sure the people in this small town want to make sure that everybody's got it. So sales stay up. This family has been in business uh, for years. And then one day, in rolls the widget salesman from the big city selling the latest and greatest widget that comes in three color options and with all of the kinks and quirks of that old widget worked out. So all the things that, you know, the the button was in the wrong spot with the old widgets, well, that that got fixed this time. And and we made it out of a new material that's lighter and lightweight and and is going to last longer and and it's going to look great. And by the way, it's at half price. Will it work? 
Maybe. It worked while he showed it to us. Is it going to last? Maybe. But hey, it's half price. Who cares? One thing that, that, that this town here, this small town, has got to learn is that loyalty, loyalty is a learned trait. Loyalty is a learned trait. So some people bought those new widgets, and they not only bought them for themselves, but they gifted them to others. While there's a few folks in town who have been around long enough to know that this is not the first widget salesman that has come into town, and they've got a pile of old, uh, new widgets sitting on the, on the heap there while Great Grandma's is still on the shelf. See, the, this is the difference between promoting speculation and promoting stewardship. Right? Passing down a product, passing on a product that, that may solve all of your problems, may answer all of your questions, may scratch all of your itches, may look better than what the old thing did, that's speculation because it may or it may not. It's new. How do you know? What is new oftentimes sounds like to our ears potential. Right? We think that if it's new, then it really could be the, 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 the thing that solves all of the issues. But it, something that's new is never time-tested. Whereas stewardship, on the other hand, is like that, that, that family uh, business that is, has been running for decades and has been passed down from generation to generation, has grown and, and, and tweaked everything so that, that it's, it's gotten something that is just solid and you know that when you get that thing, it's exactly what it is meant to, uh, it, it does exactly what it's meant to do, uh, provided that it's cared for and it's taught, uh, the next generation is taught how to run it, how to use it, and it's passed on faithfully. See, the irony is that with us in the church, when we have the truth, we have the best thing, we have the time-tested thing, we have the most attractive thing, right? It can't be improved on. Anything that is new that comes up against the truth is by nature going to be a downgrade from what we have in the truth, and yet... Loyalty is a learned trait. And yet, our eyes so quickly jump over to that new thing. Right? We are, we're, a, 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 we're a culture and always have been of advertisement. See, Paul says that a key distinction between truth and error is in what it promotes. Truth promotes the best, the authoritative message that's been delivered and guarded and handed down from generation to generation kind of like a good cast iron skillet, right? It's, not, it's only getting better as it goes. Whereas error promotes the newest innovations, the speculations that claim that they've finally worked out all of those kinks in your Bible. They finally figured out why it, that, really, that part really just seemed weird. Well, it's because, you know, whatever. It, that's actually not what it means. And they do that until the next book is written. And then now there's a new idea, a new answer. Or the next conference is offered of like, we finally understood what Jesus meant by this. And we're here to tell you all about it. Right? Novelty is easy. Loyalty is learned and it's hard work. And that is exactly what Paul is encouraging in young Timothy and in the church at Ephesus. So this morning's text lays out another comparison for us. First of all, what things promote? What does it promote? And then what does it produce? So the difference between truth and error is what it produces. Jesus warns in Matthew chapter 17 in a text about false prophets. Matthew chapter 7, I'm sorry. He warns twice that these false prophets, you will recognize them by their fruits. You'll be able to tell that somebody is not a true prophet based off of what that person produces, the fruit that they produce in their ministry. And so the product of truth, first of all, in our text, the product of truth is love. Verse 5, the aim of our charge is love. 
So you remember the charge that Paul commands Timothy to issue to these certain persons, these false teachers. He tells Timothy, you need to command them to quit leading others astray by your words and by your ways of life. Timothy was to, to hand that command directly to the false teachers. But then he says in verse 5 here that there is an aim, there is a, an end, a goal to that charge, to that command. And he says it's love. The, the product of that command is to be love. Now the word uh, aim in my, in my Bible, maybe, maybe yours says something like the goal that, that word telos refers to a thing's designated outcome, right? the intended target or the end point for that thing, where it's supposed to land. So Jesus used a similar word to this on the cross when he said to telestai, or it is finished. What's finished? Well, his life, the, the purpose of his life to come and be offered as a sacrifice for him to give up his life on the cross, that that was the finishing point of his life on earth. That was, that was its end goal. That was, the, that was the point of why he was incarnated, why he took on flesh, was to crucify that flesh and to raise it again. So he says it is finished. That was the goal of his ministry. And, and likewise, uh, Paul says that the goal of your ministry, Timothy, that the aim or the, the, the end of what I'm telling you to do with these false teachers is love. You need to love them. But notice the goal here of love, it's an ongoing thing. Right? The love is not to be just love them once with a hard word, but love is perpetual. So, so Timothy, the reason that you're going to them with this charge is because you love them. And you want to keep on loving them. You want them to turn away from that and so that, so that love is the basis of your relationship. So charge them, he says, to cease false teaching and purpose to continue your love toward them. Now here is, in this, in this point right here is a truth that frankly tastes like a bitter poison to our culture and our world today. And, and that, that bitter truth is that a command can be loving, that a command can be loving, right? Our culture thinks that if you tell someone what to do, that you're hindering them, right? Especially if they don't feel like what you've told them to do is the right thing. If they don't feel loved by your exhortation or your encouragement, then, then they say that's not loving. What you said to me wasn't loving. But notice that if that's the case, if we guard or gauge our love based off of another person and their feelings of love, that's what we learned a couple weeks ago is called subjectivity, right? Subjectivity, what is subjective, right? If truth is determined, if love is determined by the subject that is receiving that love, then basically the definition of love is not what I am doing for you. I can only ever love you if I get it right on your end. But notice what's even underneath that. Subjectivity is driven by a belief that humans are at basis not sinners. Okay, think this through with me for a minute. If the truth of something is determined by an individual, right, a subject, then that assumes that that person is never going to get it wrong. Okay, so when it comes to love, that assumes, if, if love is based off of the person being loved and whether they feel loved or not, that assumes that, that they're always going to get it right and that they're going to feel loved by the right things and that, they're, that their emotions are perfectly in tune with the reality of what is loving. All right, but we know that that's not true. Right, we, if you've ever... If you've ever encountered children, let alone raised them, right, you know that things don't feel loving to them, even though they profoundly are loving. Right? We know that that's the case in, in relationships. Right? Subjectivity 
at its basis, underneath it, believes that all people are actually good and can't get it wrong. But then we run into a problem in our culture because our culture believes in subjectivity. Our culture believes at basis that people are really good at heart. But then you've got a whole bunch of people that believe a bunch of different things. Right? And you've got people that disagree. So what do we do about that? Because, because now we've got a whole bunch of individuals saying, no, that's, that's not what I think is true. That's not what I, what I feel is true, actually. If you count, by the way, if you listen to anybody younger than like 40 talk, count up how many times you hear them say the word feel. I feel like this. I feel like that. I feel like this. I had, I had a rule in my classroom one time for, for 12th grade only that they were never to use the word I feel unless if they were describing an emotion. I said, chickens feel and then act accordingly. You think. Tell me what you think. Give me your thoughts. Right? And then if you want to tell me about your feelings, then tell me I feel. Right? But our culture is completely driven by what we feel. And what we feel is what is right. But then you've got people that feel different things, naturally. So what do we do? Well, that our, our, our cultures, our, our world's way of solving that issue is by postmodernism. And what that means is that truth is no longer something that's out there and then we all try to find it. Postmodernism says that truth is subjective. So, you know what? Uh, it's, it's just fine for you to have your truth and me to have my truth. Because if truth is defined by me, what I feel like is true, and truth is defined by you, what you feel like is true, and the, the loving thing is not to tell you that you're wrong, because how can I? Because you're defining what's true. Then all we need to do is just say, well, everybody has their own truth. And truth is here, not here. Or truth is in humans and not in the Lord. This is a messy place to be. It's a really messy place to be. It's hard to figure anything out, really, as a society, if this is the way that we determine what is right and what is wrong. Right? In, this, in this world, the best way to love your neighbor is to let them be, to encourage them in their search for truth, even if it's not your truth, and then the most offensive sin in our culture is to claim that your view is true and another person's view is false. Worse yet, to tell them that they should believe what you believe. And then we wonder why Christianity is so offensive. Because we say we have a gospel. We've got, it. We've got the truth. And by the way, the truth is that you need to bow the knee to, to, to Christ as king. You need to obey the gospel. So, so this can be a little bit uh, jarring for our culture. But that's exactly what Paul tells Timothy he ought to do. To tell these people that they, they, they've got it wrong, to give them the truth, and the product of that is love. Is love. This is the word agape, very f familiar word in the scriptures. But what is love? Baby, don't hurt me. You ever think about how true that is? That is how our culture defines love, isn't it? What is love? Don't hurt me. That's what love is. Love says, I don't want you to hurt me. I don't want to do anything. I don't want you to do anything to me that's uncomfortable. Right? The world says whatever doesn't hurt, whatever is comfortable, whatever doesn't produce a conflict, whatever feels good, that's what love is. What does God's word say? Well, here in verse 5, Paul doesn't give a definition of what love is, but, others, but other places in the Scriptures, he does describe what love does. In, to, 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 uh, to, to Timothy alone, he's told that love, the love of Christ overflowed for Paul in saving him, chapter 1, 14. He says that we must continue in love, chapter 2, verse 15, he says we must set an example, or excuse me, Timothy must set an example of love, chapter 4, verse 12, and that Timothy and the church there ought to pursue love, go after love. 
Paul tells the Ephesians in a separate letter that they ought to walk in love as Christ Jesus loved us and gave himself up for us in chapter 5, verse 2 of the book of Ephesians. Right? So love, at some point we say, love is something that we pursue. Love is something that we continue in. Love is something that is demonstrated for us in our salvation. And love is something that, that we can demonstrate to others just as Christ did for us in laying down our lives for other people. Right? This, this is uh, what love is. But then, of course, the, the familiar passage, 1 Corinthians 13, starting in verse uh, seven, uh, excuse me, verse 4, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But perhaps one of the more extensive treatments of biblical, godly love is found in 1 John. I don't know if you're as familiar with this text. 1 John chapter 4. It's a bit of a, a chunk here, but I'm going to read it in its entirety. Verses 7 and following, it says this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another... God abides in us, and His love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in Him, and He in us, because He has given us of His Spirit, and we have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him, and He in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he does not love his brother, whom he, uh, for, for he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, uh, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Biblical love has quite a bit of definition to it, has quite a bit of, of description of what it is and what it's not. And yet, how, how often do we, do we let our definition of love be first and foremost uh, altered by the way that we feel, by my feelings? And then how much do we let love be altered by the culture around us and what they say love is? Right? How different this is from a world that says things like love is love. You ever stop and think about what is being said of that definition? Love is defined, or love is in its essence, love. First of all, it's just, a, a, it doesn't make any sense. Right? You can't define a word by a word. That's like rule number one. But what are they saying? They're saying, whatever I say love is, whatever I feel love is, that's what love is. Right? So don't tell me that there's another definition of love. If I say it's love, it's love. Love is love. 
How can you deny somebody their love if they say that it is love? Right? This is subjectivity. Instead, the word tells us God is love. God loves us. In fact, the only reason we can love is because he first loved us. That's how we know what to do in love. We don't, we don't get to do, make up our own ways here. We love the way that he loves. Have I said love enough? Do we get it? <laughs> According to the truth of God's word here, the loving thing for Timothy to do is to command that, the on, that only the truth be taught in this church. That's loving. Now, in, in the church in general and in Christian relationships, conflict resolution is a big deal. What do you do when you have an issue between brothers and sisters? And the, the, the answer to this is that when there's a problem... You must love each other. You must love each other. Notice that this is, this is very different because sometimes we feel like in order to get the gumption up to go uh, confront somebody, I need to think that they're an enemy. I need to like paint them in the worst light possible in my mind so that way I, I have it clear why I'm going to talk to them. Right? Because otherwise, if you, if you start like muddling that up with good feelings about this person while also trying to hold clear what, what they've done wrong then maybe I'm not going to be clear. Maybe I'm going to go and get it all mixed up. Right? So we think, well, okay, I've got to think of them in terms of an enemy first, so that way I can get the gumption up to go talk to them and confront them about this. Well, that's wrong. That's not the Christian way. We're not enemies. And even if we were enemies, Jesus tells us to love our enemies, so we still have to love them. But, but then also the other side, we can do this where we think so much about loving the person that we're going to go confront that we can't bring ourselves to go confront them because we don't want to hurt them. We don't want to do something that makes them feel uncomfortable. And so then we end up being passive in these, in the, in, in these conflicts because we, we love the person. We love them so much we can't bear to, to, to say a hard word to them. Well, that's not right either. Right? Paul says to Timothy, love them and confront them. Tell them to stop. That is loving. Right? This is the, 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 I think that one of the more helpful things in, Christ, in my Christian walk has been somebody telling me that in Christ... We are new creations. So to confront somebody's sin is to go to them and say, Brother, what I see in you is not Christ, which means that's not who you are. And so I'm asking you to, to cut that out, literally cut that out of your life, because that's not who you are in Christ. Right? It's not a, what's wrong with you, you numbskull. <laughs> right? It's a, no, brother, sister, this, this, is, not, this is not the way. Let's walk together in this. That's the loving thing to do. But notice then in verse 5, the source of love. He tells us the aim is love. That's the product of truth. But the source of this love is three things. A pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Pure heart, good conscience, sincere faith. First, a pure heart. That word pure is the word for clean. It's a heart that is not stained or tainted by our own sin, let alone by having a hard heart that has not been saved by the gospel. Right? This is a love that's coming out of a heart that knows what love is because it knows the love that God has had for me. Right? This is a heart that's been washed clean. Right? For love to be genuine between people, the heart must be clean. This is the principle that Jesus gives in Luke chapter 6, verse 45, uh, when he says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So, Timothy, if you're going to speak this charge to these false teachers, and you're going to do it in a way that's still loving and not hateful, you need to make sure, Timothy, that your heart is clean. You need to make sure that you're right with the Lord, that, that, that you don't have any animosity built up in your heart. Only a clean heart can produce this type of love that he's talking about here, right? This is just like you can't get blood from a turnip. You can't get love from a corrupt heart, right? It's just not possible. But, but what's interesting is because he says that love comes from this type of a heart, that means this type of a heart is possible, right? Sometimes if, if we believe the doctrine that's true that says that, that humans are sinful and even after we get saved, we still have the old nature that wants to 
to, to pop its head up in our life. Sometimes evangelicals, good Christians like us, can, can make such a big deal about it and just say, I can't do anything right. I'm such a sinner. I'm so, I'm so sinful. There's no possibility that I could do this thing lovingly because, you know, I, I'm just so tainted by sin. Well, it is true that we're tainted by sin and that sin goes to the deepest corners of our life. But apparently, we can have our hearts cleansed in order to love the way that we're to love. How do we do that? Well, 1 John 1, 9 tells us if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do you believe that? Do you believe that confessing your sins is cleansing from sin? Do you believe that you can be like Jesus told his disciples, you are clean? Right? John 13, when he's going to wash his feet, Peter says, wash all of me, Lord. And what does Jesus say to him? He says, you are clean, but not every one of you. Right? We can be cleansed. The, the psalmist prays in Psalm 51, 6, create in me a clean heart, O God. Notice, who can create a clean heart? Only God. Only God can create a clean heart in you, can cleanse your heart of the sin that so easily uh, uh, entangles us, that so easily stains us and taints us. And yet God can do that. God wants to do that. So the, the, the goal of love comes from a pure heart and secondly, a clear conscience. One commentator wrote this about this idea of conscience. It, conscience summarizes uh, its threefold uh, or uh, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the uh, commentator summarizes the threefold function of, con of conscience in Scripture. Number one, to urge right and to hinder wrong. Number two, to pass judgment on a decision or an action. And number three, to produce guilt or commendation in the heart. Co our, our consciences are, help us decipher through right and wrong. It helps us follow that path. It's what we feel, you know, and, and sometimes people think conscience is here, but really conscience is here, right? That, that burning feeling that you feel when something's not right, right? That's the God-given mechanism to help us understand what is right and what is wrong. So what, what, what Paul tells Timothy is that if you're going to love somebody uh, by doing the hard thing and telling them what's right and wrong, you can't do it if your belly is burning, Okay? If you're not certain that what you're about ready to do is the right thing, then you're not qualified to be the one to go and confront that person. Your conscience must be clear. You must, at that moment, have, have, have not have that uncomfortable feeling there, but, but be assured by the Scriptures that what you're, what you're taking part in is true, is the truth. But here again, there's, there's a guardrail. Because Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4.4, 4, he says, I'm not aware of anything against myself. In other words, his conscience is clear. But I am not thereby acquitted. He says, it is the Lord who judges me. Right? Because what, what the reality is, is that we can sear our conscience. We can dull our consciences. We can get so used to having that, that burning feeling rise up within us and then pushing it aside and, and calming ourselves and massaging that feeling out of our hearts so that we don't actually think that what we're about to do is wrong. We can get so used to doing that that just because my conscience is clear doesn't make it right. Notice what Paul is, what, what he's doing here is he's denying subjectivity. He's saying that I'm not the one that decides what's right and wrong here. Right? Our consciences are not the, the, the ultimate guide for truth. Right? Because we can, we can err. We can be wrong. And yet, if we're going to go confront somebody and, and ask them to walk in truth, he says you've got to do it with a clear conscience. Thirdly, love comes from a sincere faith. That word sincere is the word for not hypocritical. A not hypocritical faith. This is a faith that walks the way that you talk. This is a faith that does not have two faces to it. This is a faith that is consistent no matter where you catch the person, no matter what time of day. 
no matter what room, whether at work or at home. This is an unhypocritical faith. Again, Jesus lays this principle out in Luke chapter 6, verse 42. He says, how can you say to your brother, brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite, he says. You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Right? A hypocrite is one who says one thing, oh, hey, you got that sin in your life, while having sometimes a much bigger sin of the same sort in their own life. Right? He says, that's not loving. That's not, that's not the source of love. Hypocrisy does what the Pharisees did, where they, they lay heavy burdens on people, on other people, and they're not w- willing to even lift their pinky finger up toward any of these things. Right? Hypocrisy is not love. But notice again what Paul is doing here. He's telling Timothy, Timothy, you need to lay out your life in front of these people. When you go confront these people, you need to be willing to let them uh, scrutinize your heart, to scrutinize your conscience, to scrutinize your way of life, your walk of life. And they need to be able to look at each one of those things and to see that really there is no animosity in your heart toward them, but that you're loving. That's how these false teachers, that's how this church is to be able to see that Timothy is the real deal and these false apostles are not the real deal. They're supposed to be able to look at Timothy's life, to hear Timothy's words, and to say, I think he's got the truth. Because not only are his words clear, but his heart is clear. I know that he is loving here. This is what truth produces. It's love. So do you see just in, in terms of application, how does this put feet in our lives? Or how does this have feet in our lives? Do you see that character matters in the arena of truth? Let me say that again. Character matters in the arena of truth. Right? Somebody who is, who is, who is claiming to have the truth must also have character for God's people to follow them. If they have the truth and not character, then you ought to doubt the truth that they have. Character and truth go hand in hand. Spiritual maturity matters when it comes to truth. Holiness and love are essential in deciphering truth from error. So if you have someone who is constantly teaching really interesting head scratchers. Right? They, they seem to just be able to read between the lines always and find these, these super deep insights that I can't really see it in the text, but man, it sounds really good. And then you have somebody who just reads the verse, and then in explaining the verse, they just read the verse again. <laughs> right? We all know people like, we've had teachers like that, where you ask them a question and they say, well, let me read it again for you, and they just read the verse again, sometimes with a flannel graph, Right? If you have somebody like that, that just puts the plain teaching out there versus somebody who is always like throwing you curveballs, take number two. Take the plain teacher every time. If you have someone who powerfully points to verses in the Bible and yet is living in sin, knowingly living in sin, walking in unrighteousness, and then you have someone who lives a holy life but preaches mediocre sermons, take number two every time. If, if you have someone who says all the right things, who, who, who preaches all the right things, but they do it from a mile away, or they do it from a TV screen away, and then you have someone who says the right things in your living room, or at the hospital bed, or in the nursing home, or at the funeral home, or around the dinner table. Take number two. 
Right? Paul told Timothy to remain here, to stay in this church, to love these people. Right? Don't, don't, don't listen to the, the person that's far off. They don't, have, they don't have skin in the game. Right? The point is not just to be doctrinally right, but to have right doctrine and right practice coming from people who are examples of both of those things. So that's the product of truth. It's love. You should be able to see love when you, see, when you hear truth. But look at verse 6. These certain persons have left those marks of truth behind. It says certain persons by swerving from these, by turning away from these. That word swerve is like if you've got a, a, a target in front of you and constantly, it's not even just like a little bit off, it's totally missing the target every time. These people have constantly missed the target of those three sources of love. They do not have the sources of love in, them, in their lives, and therefore their ministry uh, inevitably lacks love. Remember what Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruit. Right? So, so Paul points out to us here that the root of this false teaching that, that is happening in Ephesus is really moral and not intellectual. Right? The root of this false teaching has to do with these false teachers' heart, not just what's coming out of their mouth. You need to quiet what's coming out of their mouth, but the bigger issue is, Timothy, that their heart isn't right. So you need to love them and call them to truth. Right? Certain people hold on to false theology because their hearts aren't clean, their consciences aren't clear, and their faith is full of, of, of hypocrisy. But one way... Uh, to release that tension of a dirty, divided, hypocritical life, if, if you feel that that's where you're at, you feel like you're not measuring up, one way to release the tension there is by changing the standard. Right? You can either, uh, right, the tension has to be relieved. So you can either do what the Bible says and confess that sin and to have a cleansed heart, a cleansed life, or if you're not willing to confess that sin, then what you, ought, what you have to do is go over here to the standard and say, well, we must have got the standard wrong. We must have misunderstood that verse. We must not have understood exactly what Jesus meant when he said X, Y, Z. Right? And this is, this is common fodder for, for false teachers. Right? They go to that verse and they say, well, what Jesus really meant when he said this, or, or what, what Paul really meant in the context of the culture was this, Right? And, we, and then they, we, we bend the standard because we, we have to deal with our consciences. Now, that doesn't mean that genuine people don't sometimes get it wrong, but what it does mean is that a clear, pure heart will confess when they're confronted with these false ideas. Right? Somebody who is, is saying, I think I got this wrong. You know, I thought that was really interesting, but, but it doesn't seem like it was right. When I look back to the word, when I heard some good counsel from people who loved me, I see that that, that, that was error. Right? They are the ones that change, not the teaching. God is holy. We are not. We're sinners, and so we should be the ones who expect to have our consciences pricked and our lives molded. So what then does error produce? If truth produces love... See what Paul says error produces in verse 6, vain discussions. He says they've, they've swerved away from the sources of love and therefore have wandered away into vain <clears throat> discussions. By the way, this is the best thing that hypocrites can do. Empty talk, conversations that are, are an inch deep and a mile wide, that's the best thing that hypocrites can do because if the, if the conversation starts getting into their life, if, if, if the truth gets really deep, if somebody applies a text that, that really just uh, hits home in their life, well, now they've got one more thing that they've got to try to, to, to cover over. Right? They've got one more area of conscience that feels off to them. Right? A hypocrite, one who, who says the right things but doesn't walk that way, can't handle deep truths from the scriptures because that adds to their heap of things that they feel guilty about. Right? So it, they, they have to have these empty discussions. That's what that word vain means. It means emptiness. It's like cotton candy, light, feel good, fluffy. 
Right? If they ever talked about real weighty things, they know that it would require something from their life. Right? And hypocrites don't want that. Right? So, for example, it's fashionable in our day to discuss whether Adam was a real person or simply a, a symbol for humanity in Scripture. He was just like a, a, a type. Why? Why, why? why go after Adam? Well, because if Adam is mythological, if Adam is not a real person, then that means Adam's sin is not a real thing that, that has been transferred down to me, which means that I can feel better about my sin because Adam really wasn't a real person that passed down sin from generation to generation. It's just kind of a, it's just a metaphor, they'll say. Well, what about creation in six days? Why go after what the Bible clearly teaches on this point? Because if God created in such a way, then he has a claim on us and on our days. Do you know that creation in six days is how God roots the command to take a Sabbath rest? He says, for in six days God made the world and then rested on the seventh. Well, that's a command on us then. That's, a, that's something that is required of us. What about a global flood? Why is it that these people want to go after the idea that, that Genesis 6 through 9 is as it reads, a global flood? Well, because if God can universally judge the world like that, if he can wipe out the whole earth like that, then that means he can do it again. And that means then that the call, the gospel call to come and get on the boat, so to speak, to come, and to, to, come to Christ and save yourself from that judgment, that means that gospel call is universal. Which means that I can no longer look at my Muslim neighbor and say that, that you know what, he's got a really good heart, so there's no way that God would judge him. If God's judgment is true, it requires something of us. Right? And we just don't want that. So we leave the conversation an inch deep, a mile wide, never talk about anything too serious, never get into the weeds of life, never say, this is what you must do by the, because of this word. We never do that because our consciences are already too heaped up. Verse 7, look at the next thing that it produces. Error produces an arrogant ignorance. Verse 7 Error produces arrogant ignorance. They desire to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. These certain persons desire to be teachers of the law. They want to teach the law of God. Now, the word desire here refers to a subjective impulse inside of somebody arising from yourself to do something. So if you desire to do something, it's not because somebody told you it's because you decided on your own. So these are people who just one day uh, decided as they're, you know, in their, <clears throat> whatever, their meditation prayer closet, I think I really want to be a teacher of the law. I think I really want to be somebody that people look up to, that people listen to. And they get that in their head, and then they go about what they feel like they need to do. They, they start coming up with interesting theories about the law. They start looking into the, in between the lines and saying, man, people are going to really eat this up. They're going to want to come hear me speak on this. And what he says is that that subjectivity leads to them teaching things that are false, that are pure speculation. They don't even understand the things that they are saying. Now, oftentimes, people, we, we have to take a minute to, like, listen to what somebody is saying in order to understand it. So maybe some of you are in that, in that phase right now where you're hearing my words and you're saying, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm tracking. I want to, like, point one, point two, like, what, what's, what's coming across here, right? You hear somebody else, and then you have to consider what they're saying to understand. These people, Paul says, they don't even understand what's coming out of their own mouth, let alone somebody else. Do you, do you see that, verse 7? without understanding either what they are saying or about the things which they make confident assertions. So on the one hand, they are ignorant. They're ignorant, which means they don't know. They have no clue what they're speaking of. And what is the subject matter? It's God's law. 
right? It's, it's the Old Testament that they're making claims about, and they have no clue what they're saying. Now, there again, talk about offensive. Can you imagine somebody telling a teacher, right, in a small group Bible study or something, they, they make some statement, and, and somebody, you know, just looks at them and says, brother, um, I, I don't think you got that right. I don't think that's what that says. I don't think that's what that verse means. Because look at verse 6 or look at verse 2. Right? That would be offensive. Right? But these people are, are totally off base. They're, they're ignorant of the things that they are speaking. But notice how ignorance and arrogance go hand in hand. Verse 7, he says it's the things they, they desire to be teachers of the law. And then they don't understand what, uh, the things that they make confident assertions about or affirmations about. So in other words, they're saying these things, and they're saying it strongly. They're insisting on that this is what's true. This is right. They're, they're saying it persuasively. And yet they're just dead wrong. They missed the boat completely. Ignorance and arrogance go hand in hand, right? And many of these vain discussions, these false teachers, these errors, this is why they can become a battle royale, right? This is why people can get really worked up about these issues that are in between the lines. Because what are you defending? You're defending your opinion, right? You're defending your opinion. You're defending how you feel about that text, and you're doing it against somebody else and their feelings and their opinions about that text. And so, of course, it's like, you know, rams going at it with their horns because we're just fighting about our, our, our feelings at this point. Right? Ignorance and arrogance go hand in hand, and we ought to watch out for that sort of thing. When we see dogmatism, when we see confidence about things that are not in the text, when we see confidence about maybes, that's a red flag. Right? Instead, Timothy is to go to these people and to lay out in front of them, also confidently, the truth, the plain truth, and to call them to order their lives uh, around that. So when we find ourselves in a situation like this, what does maintaining the faith look like? Well, it looks like love. It looks like dealing with these things, these threats to, uh, to false doctrine, by, or to true, to, to true doctrine, dealing with false doctrine in love. Identifying it, calling it out, walking alongside the person, and doing it in love. Let's pray. God, I pray that in our hearts, Lord, that you would produce love from us. Lord, cleanse our hearts. Clear our consciences. Lord, make us unhypocritical. Help us to walk worthy of the calling to which we've been called. God, we, we want faithfulness. We want to walk and build and grow the way that you've called us to. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's stand together in closing and turn in your hymnals to number 24. My Jesus, I love thee, number 24. My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine, for thee all the 